Well, over the next 30 minutes, we're talking about connected TV and in particular the role of smart TVs in how we help content producers and distributors reach the missing millions. So that's the cord cutters, the cord shavers and the cord nevers and a few others who are watching less linear TV or broadcast TV to be more precise. Uh, and to join us for this, we have David Burton, who is head of product at Samsung Ads Europe. We have Kasia Yablonska, head of digital distribution and monetization at Endemol Shine Group and Aaron Maliars, who is the Director for Content and Channels at Insight TV. So welcome to all of you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, David, I mean, this is a big question I'm going to ask you, but I mean, from your sort of 40,000 feet view, and given that Samsung have been in this, this industry for over 10 years now, um, how do you see the TV landscape changing? Okay, well, it's a big, big question straight off the bat, straight in the deep end. Uh, so I'll, I'll give it a good go. So, you know, first off, I'd just say that uh, I come from the world of product. So, you know, building things for consumers and I might have a slightly different lens from other answers that have been given in the industry. But, you know, I think this is the question all about how we define TV in this day and age. So I try and break it down into three key areas, I guess. Number one is the device itself. So the, the big box in our lounges. Number two uh, is the type of content being viewed on that device. Uh, and number three is the viewing behaviors that are changing. So if we start with the device, I think if we rewind back to the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, the only way you could get content onto your box was through a terrestrial TV aerial, uh, a satellite dish or a cable. And in 2008, Samsung launched the first smart TV onto the world. So it was a connected TV and it fundamentally changed the device technically in your lounge. You could now get content through the internet. Um, and that leads on to the second point, the type of content you can now receive and enjoy on that box. So again, in the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, the content was really being produced by the broadcasters, the big networks and the big movie studios. So it was typically, you know, your big budget, long form type content. Uh, it was very much scheduled viewing. However, in 2008, in the last 12 years up to 2020, what we've now seen, thanks to the, the influx of internet delivered content is a whole new range uh, of content you can enjoy on your TV um, and we often talk in the industry I've heard people talk in the industry about premium content and budget content and you know OTT delivered content can typically be budget content and I, I fundamentally disagree with that I think uh, there's a time and place still for your big budget premium long-form content in this day and age it's delivered by the internet but more interestingly what we're seeing is more niches uh, or more subcultures of content come into the industry and that's largely because of the OTT enablement um, so I think the content is fundamentally changed uh, and then thirdly uh, it's the viewing behavior itself so when you had scheduled linear traditional TV you had to tune in at a certain time of day whereas with the OTT it lends itself to the video on demand capability uh, we're seeing uh, people Obviously, we hear a lot about this viewing more OTT, uh, shifting from linear into OTT, and we're going to talk more about that shortly. Uh, but it's important to recognize that linear TV, traditional TV viewing still takes the lion's share of viewing hours. Uh, but what I think is most uh, interesting at Samsung from a, a viewing behavior perspective is uh, what we term platform surfing. So what we are able to see at Samsung is people dip in and out of the different platforms. And, and by that, I mean their live traditional TV, which might be free view. They might then dip in and out of their set top box, whether that's Sky, Virgin, Talk, Talk or BT. They might then dip in and out of a games console onto a streaming device and then in and out of the, the streaming apps that are on the TV. So what we're seeing at Samsung is platform surfing people moving in and out of live linear schedule broadcast into video on demand I and mean, then i think at samsung just sort of my closing statement uh, that hopefully brings us all together is our streaming app so we launched a streaming app into market a few months ago called samsung tv plus um, and you know largely this is why cashier and aaron and i are here today to talk about samsung tv plus and how this has helped new content providers and partners get their content out at scale uh, to people who are now shifting away from linear TV into OTT. And I think 
what we've tried to do with TV Plus is tackle that problem from a user experience perspective, because in Samsung TV Plus, we bring in your free view linear TV programming alongside your OTT channels. So a user can seamlessly go in and out of live traditional broadcast TV and then into new content from the likes of Cashier and Endemol and Arana Insight TV. And this has now opened up this range of content. We've got the measurement data to help inform our content strategy for users, but also for Akashia and Aaron. So to summarize all that, I would say TV has fundamentally changed over the last 12 years. The device itself has changed. The type of content we're seeing on the TV has changed and viewing behaviors have fundamentally shifted as well. So I hope that helps set the you know, tone for the next 20 minutes. Yeah, that's a great scene setter. And Aaron, I mean, do you do you like this vision of Samsung TV Plus? I mean, your company, you come from cable, you're on cable as well. So you've not always been, you're not a digital first uh, sort of media company. No. And you're, you're 4K focus. I mean, do you like the idea of everything mixed together in a sort of an EPG with streaming content there as well? Yeah, so all, all of these um, uh, new devices and new new products, they have like, there's always room for opportunity. Um, to tack on David's first point saying, you know, TV has changed in the last 12 years, yes, definitely. So first of all, the TVs became bigger. Uh, and that's when we started saying, okay, you know, HD was the, was the standard. Uh, the new TVs are all 4K HDR. Let's immediately start producing in that kind of, uh, that kind of a technology specification. So at least we make our content future-proof and can actually form a connection with, with uh, the TV manufacturers. Uh, and actually that's where our partnership with Samsung started. So we, we did that on, on a 4K uh, pr uh, promise. Uh, and then Samsung came us uh, two, three years ago saying we're launching this, this, this service uh, TV Plus in, in, in the US and uh, in various other territories. Do you like to be part of that? It's just a linear stream only delivered via uh, uh, digitally. Um, and then of course we had a discussion a traditional discussion, as you also said, David, like uh, long form and premium content should be on the cable platforms and not maybe on a free service. So we started out with our, you know, library content first. And after six months, the uptake was just, you know, blew us away. Uh, and from that moment on, we, we, we started to adding more channels to it. Uh, and of course, you also see that other companies in the world are also starting up these, these digital linear channels via uh, IP streams. Uh, and especially on connected devices, these streams are being watched massively. Uh, and sometimes, that's what I heard on, on, on one of these conferences, that you know we confuse the demise of linear TV. Basically, people saying, "Oh, I don't watch linear TV anymore. Or I don't like it." Maybe they didn't like the cable subscription of that amount of money they had to put away every month. But actually, flipping through channels and just stay on them uh, for for a while is still uh, is still very much appealing. Uh, adding to that, uh, a linear digital stream has also uh, a commercial value because you can do CPM advertising, digital CPM advertising, instead of uh, the older uh, traditional model around GRPs. Uh, in the end, that's more lucrative anyway. So it, it cuts on content side, consumer side, and also commercial side. It, it makes sense and hope um, we see more results uh, of this in the future as well. Yeah. Okay, so for you, you, you love the fact that it's scheduled as well. And even though it's streaming, people still like linear and scheduled. Yeah, yeah, d definitely. So we started off with, with a loop, basically a playlist of all, all uh, different shows together. It was the easy way to deliver. And last year we, we switched from, um, from providers, which basically connects now uh, the Amagi ACLS streams to our traditional scheduler system, What's On. So basically we're scheduling the Samsung TV Plus uh, uh, channels. Uh, and also across uh, other platforms. The digital ones, we schedule in like a linear TV service, only now we have way more data. So actually we can schedule better uh, than we ever could before. Okay, and Kasia, I know, um, you know, linear is proving quite good for you, isn't it, as well? Or at least yes. a schedule. Yes, uh, I would say, so interestingly, obviously, Endemol Shine is one of the biggest uh, independence production and distribution company. So uh, production distribution is something that we do. We have in the past, we've never really sort of did this type of the distribution deals. So this kind of type of the partnerships. However, as the um, consumption models are changing and uh, obviously viewers are consuming more and more content, they just consuming it in a very different way. 
that has a major impact on the value chain within media industry and also what the production and distributions companies are doing. And as you know, um, I think I would just refer to what David was saying about the premium and budget content. Uh, in this kind of more traditional, uh, I, I would even use the word linear distribution world, where you actually did your content licensing deal with the broadcasters, the value was always in the first window. The, as older, the older the catalog got, there was less value in this content, and therefore you were getting paid less and less money. And uh, two years ago, we've just decided, okay, let's kind of let the viewers vote with their eyeballs. Let's go straight to the platforms where we can, maybe we're not getting fixed fees, but we will be able to actually generate some extra revenue straight from, by sort of um, straight going straight to the viewer. And to our astonishment, turned out that this is actually an amazing opportunity viewers are hungry for this catalog content. Some of those titles we actually put out there on Samsung are generating probably five, maybe to 10 times more what we would get from the broadcaster who actually looks at this content more from the perspective it's five, 10 years old. We don't really want to kind of pay for it anymore. So to us, what is so amazing is just this ability to cut in a way a middleman be in control of this relationship with a consumer by using a platform, a highly technical platform, which is coming to us already with a consumer's base and gives us an ability to resurface this content and to show it directly uh, to the viewer. And then, no, I just, uh, what, what, sorry, John, one point Cashier you know, talks about there, which I think is really relevant um, and sometimes misunderstood is that you often see the headlines uh, in the industry about the, uh, production investment for new new content. Um, so you, you see the big tech companies, media companies, announcing the billions of dollars they're putting into new content. However, what we're seeing is traditional nostalgic uh, TV is incredibly popular. So, you know, working with Endemol, we have MasterChef, incredibly popular in the UK. Uh, I think recently Deal or No Deal was released. Uh, it was out in the States, Cashier. Yeah. Yeah, and, and drawing in millions of viewers there. And probably one of the most exciting things I heard recently um, is Peaky Blinders is being released on TV Plus uh, with Samsung in Germany uh, soon. And why I'm so excited is because it was probably one of the most popular, um, you know, series, particularly in the Burton household. It was one of the series that both <laughs> my wife and I both found we enjoyed, which is often a very, you know, niche Venn intersect where we both... Uh, can enjoy the content so you know it's not it's not new content but it's incredibly popular we know some of the most popular content you know i'm still watching friends i'm still watching the office you know 20 25 years on and i think that's what we're seeing more and more by having the data uh, at samsung being able to share with cashier and Aaron and our other content partners it's informing their strategy and it's not all new long-form big production content there's a whole whole range now from old school classics and nostalgic TV all the way through to short form user generated content. So, yeah, I think it's a really key point Cashier was talking about. Yeah. So in terms of the data then, I mean, you know, Cashier and Aaron, how do you sort of decide what you're launching? I mean, you know, if they're kind of, you've both launched channels on Samsung TV Plus that are pulling together a kind of curation of uh, other shows that you already have. Uh, or you're creating especially and sometimes they cross a, a few genres together but they're a nice bundle i mean how do you you know what kind of data do you get back from samsung for example that helps you to to sort of drive where you launch countries that you launch in and what you put together and which shows go into those bundles in each each territory for example so if, if i can start so data is extremely important to us and i think one of the reasons why uh, the digital team at endemol shire has been so successful because we rely very heavily on data including samsung tv data uh, we uh, have a small sort of data scientist team where we literally just every day check the hours viewed on the title level, we literally look how long it takes for the title to kind of peak in viewing, how long it plateaus, and then how quickly it goes down. And based on this, we can look, as I said, on the title level, on the genre level. And we even based on this, we are able to take a decision. What content works in what markets? Uh, what platform actually is interested in what kind of content? 
So having worked with Samsung now, uh, I would say for about six months, we know that the audiences are, at this stage, they're much more interested in non-scripted shows. They're interested in a gaming shows. Uh, one of the reasons why so far we've launched um, Masters of Food, which is our sort of genre-based dedicated food channel, DIY Daily, which is another uh, dedicated uh, no scripted shows channels. We also have recently gone out with scripted uh, pretty much across all European countries Samsung is in. However, scripted is still a question mark. We're not sure yet how well that will perform. I think people probably are much more kind of people come watch and then go away. They don't really come back and repeat it as often. But as I said, the biggest success so far we've seen is with Deal or No Deal in uh, US, which within a month, it's already generating almost a million hours viewed. Um, so yeah, so basically data is extremely important and it helps us to kind of then decide market by market what we're going after. Yeah. Well, um, I totally echo what, what, what um, Akasha is saying. Uh, on, on data coming from PV plus uh, non scripted we are we are focusing on, on non scripted in you know as a whole so um, and we've seen like people if they go onto our channel they stay there for for a long time uh, going back to the day that's also really interesting to see that there is a major difference between countries we, we are all already know that there's a difference in taste and and maybe uh, pacing or, or storylines between European countries and maybe the US um, like we, we definitely see like some of the titles which are working in the US are maybe more yeah US focused but more sport centric uh, still with the backstory but but that, that's what, what really works in Germany you see like we have a show called Ghost Chasers and a few more of those scientific shows they are always amongst the top five uh, uh, titles watched so it's really interesting to see how how that differs between the, the territories um, and also channels we now have um, uh, three channels uh, Inside TV is the lifestyle one. Uh, in Wonder is uh, focusing on uh, factual entertainment, science and technology. And In Trouble is on, uh, on uh, action sports. And it's interesting to see that uh, In Wonder is really popular in, in Germany. And Inside TV as a lifestyle channel is more popular in, in the US. So that's, um, that, that, that those data, the data is really interesting to see. In terms of what we pick to produce, uh, apart from this data, we combine all data points across all the channels. But also we have uh, within our marketing team, we have something called Inside TV Labs. So we're, we're, we're studying a topic and we're really diving into it before we do a show on it. So that uh, all, all data driven, yeah. Okay, David, just give us an idea of exactly the kind of data you can offer and then, you know, give us a sort of a, a bigger view of audience trends that you're seeing across the platform as a whole based on the data that you do gather. Okay, sure. Um... So look, I guess, I guess there's uh, various insights that we can we can share, and um, I think everyone loves a bit of number wang when it comes to <laughs> tracking our stats on on, on viewing behaviour. But b before before I share uh, a couple of stats, um, I think it's important to understand the methodology about the data that we collect, because um, obviously different methodologies and different conclusions can be drawn from that. So I think off the bat, it's important to recognise that we're collecting viewing data from. 5 million TVs or just over 5 million TVs in the UK, uh, millions more across uh, the rest of Europe. Uh, and our data, we don't model any of the data. It's one-to-one, -one, it's deterministic, it's real time as Kashi was talking about it. You can view what's happening day by day. So that's the first and second thing. The third thing is um, all the viewing data we collect is at the glass level. So we take an agnostic position, a neutral position with our viewing data. We're looking at everything that's going on uh, through the TV in terms of behavior. So this is how we can identify this platform surfing uh, term we've, we've conjured up at Samsung. And so we can see uh, when people are moving between, you know, live linear free view into our Samsung TV plus app, into their set top boxes, streaming devices. So we get a complete view of viewing data that's going on at the glass level, okay? So that, that's the methodology. Uh, a couple of, couple of stats to share. I think the first one is 14%, one four. 14%. And this says that 14% of our Samsung TVs in the UK are only consuming internet delivered content, OTT content. So the importance of that, you know, obviously for content partners and, and advertisers, if you're trying to reach that audience, you can't reach them through traditional live broadcast television. You've got to be trying to reach them through OTT. So that's the first stat, 14% are 
of Samsung TVs in the UK are only consuming content via the internet. The second stat is causing a little bit more controversy in the industry in certain areas, and it's our 42% stat. And what this says is 42% of our Samsung TVs in the UK are only watching up to two hours or less of, of linear broadcast TV per month, 42%. So that, that's close to half. Either way, that's millions of TVs in the UK and across the UK are only watching up to two hours of, of live linear broadcast TV per month. So again, if you're a content partner like Endemol or Insight TV or other content partners or advertisers, trying to reach that audience to get your content in front of them, to try and get your ads in front of them, you're really going to struggle to do that through traditional live linear broadcast routes. You've got to be thinking OTT, you've got to be thinking CTV. Okay, and Aaron, I mean, do you look at connected TV, in particular the TV screen with streaming, as your kind of route to reach that sort of low linear audience? Yeah, so uh, as, at Inside TV, we're focusing on millennials and, and also Generation G, uh, which actually is supposed to be not watching linear TV at all anymore, at least, it, it, which is declining. But what we see in connected devices, of course, you know, on Samsung TV Plus, but also on others, is that uh, especially in the millennial areas, when millennials get a little bit older, their behavior is also going to change more, you know, I wouldn't say traditionally, but when you come home, you know, when you're 26, you come home after your first job, you know, you switch on the TV and you just like to have something on there uh, and then stay on that, uh, that, that channel. Uh, is often more inclined, they're more inclined to do that than going to Netflix or to other ones and just, you know, clicking something on because it's just there. Then, of course, everyone is using those apps and me included because that's where you go uh, to watch um, uh, movies or the series you like. But in terms of going home, switching on the TV and that there's a linear thing there, and then you go to cooking or you know, do with something with the family, the linear thing is still so important also for, for, for that, um, uh, that target audience, what we see. And that's really interesting to see that, you know, that we're still um, uh, having that media and that um, uh, the target group coming to our channels because that's, that's what we're aiming for with our content. Okay, and I mean, Kasia, you obviously use broadcast uh, in a big way still. You do lots of deals with broadcasters and also some with SVOD. And um, so for you, what does Connected TV deliver? Yes, yeah, so obviously uh, the sort of broadcast production is still our main sort of daily bread. Uh, However, the, the monetization of the catalog is becoming bigger and bigger part of our revenues. And the, that's what Connected TV delivers, this ability, as, as I've mentioned, to go directly to the viewer. And uh, I agree with Aaron. Connected TV is already in a living room. So you've kind of crossed the barriers to entry. You're right in where people can see you. Uh, as Aaron is saying, those, you, there's no need to learn new technology. Those, new, those viewers know how to operate television. Now they just have an ability of switch between linear and nonlinear. The um, ecosystem is easy to navigate, which means it's really easy to discover your content. The, the linear viewing, people are creatures of habits despite everything else. So the fact that you actually have a linear EPG sitting on OTT is definitely helping as well to discover that content. And also those audiences know Endemol Shine Productions from the, from the broadcasting world. So in a way, a single title is uh, channels or single title are becoming a destiny for them as well. That's why I think... Uh, just having a single title catalog like uh, Deal or No Deal or Wipeout or MasterChef is just really working miracles for us because people recognize the title, they can watch it through the linear EPG, they can easily switch if they want to to the newest season on the broadcasting channel and this combination is just seems to be working extremely well for us. Okay, and it's also sort of helped you diversify, hasn't it? Because I know, you know, COVID-19, you had to stop production, in effect, which once upon a time would have been your, probably your only source of income. Yes. But now it's not, is it? Yes, though that's true. Like most of the other production companies, productions were put on hold, the, the sales of the formats as well. So the company really had to rely heavily on monetizing catalog, which involves both uh, licensing that catalog to the uh, sort of more traditional way and us sort of doing the revenue share deals. 
I think that the biggest fear at the beginning was whether we will be able to keep up working remotely from home with uh, uploading of the files. And to our surprise, technology actually uh, helped us. Technology didn't kind of give up on us. Uh, the fact that we, we basically work already in the cloud, we have almost 30,000 assets sitting already in the cloud. So the fact that it was just so easy to connect with Samsung and just keep on uploading those files directly through the uh, world, which is a platform Samsung is using to deliver channels, uh, we didn't slow down at all. We just kept on delivering about 1,500 assets per month. We launched uh, three new channels in US on Samsung at this time. And we also are able to keep re-optimizing content, which is already on Samsung. Effectively, what it means, we provide new artwork, we provide new metadata, and we've managed to actually deliver uh, about 500 new pieces of artwork uh, per month. So we actually, we pulled ourselves together and somehow managed to actually go at scale with monetizing a catalog through this period. They're very much a service provider now as well. Yeah. And and David, um, I mean, beyond what we've already talked about, what do you consider the benefits of streaming uh, versus broadcasting, especially if we're talking about the big screen in the, in the living room? Um, so, you know, I think there's, I think there's a, a number, of, number of benefits, really. I think um, the, the obvious one is the, uh, the available data. So, you know, from, a, from a, an ads perspective, you know, the ability to uh, serve more interest-based advertising, uh, by understanding people's viewing habits, interests, um, you know, I think you can call it personalized advertising or tailored advertising. My favorite term is interest-based advertising because we're generally trying to serve more interesting adverts and particularly for Samsung. I don't know if everyone knows, but the Samsung ads business was really born out of the content discovery area so we're seeing this influx of content in the golden or platinum age of tv which is talking about how much content there's now available but that you know frankly can be quite overwhelming hence why we talk about scheduled tv linear epg so we can turn it on at the end of a, a busy day and the content's there for us so having the data to serve interest-based advertising that really help drive people into the content they're enjoying um, i think is a huge benefit of ott delivered uh, content and um, the next one I'd probably talk about is probably interaction so you know we've always got to remember there's a human being a TV viewer uh, sitting in front of the TV and you know you can argue either way on this but I think the ability to skip ads is a really important interaction uh, capability on an ad and um, you can see the seconds counting down informing the user really simply um, of how long they're going to have to watch this ad. Do they want to watch more? Do they want to skip it? The, the ability to click through uh, either to a website or onto uh, microsites hosted on the TV that we sometimes uh, do for our advertisers. So they can get more content, more behind the scenes footage is quite a popular one. Um, and then finally, it all links together, I guess, with the measurement. So it goes back to data again, being able to understand, particularly from a content partner, point of view what content is working for them as content partners but most importantly we're all vested in trying to get the right content in front of human beings our customers uh, because we've only got an ads business if we can draw the audience and that audience is coming to view the content so you know i think you know the three three things that spring to mind the interest-based advertising the interaction you can have with those ads and finally the measurement okay. and aaron and Kasia, in, in any particular order i mean what's your sort of view of how you want to use advertising in the connected TV environment and what you see, how you see the experience evolving in a sort of a minute or two. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, um, uh, I think the, um, the digital ad space, how we did it at first, it's, it's much improved. You know, at first we had like sometimes because the algorithm works like that, uh, two or three of the same spots in the same ad break now is becoming, you know, there's no latency of loading the ads anymore. Uh, there's multiple different um, uh, ads within one break, like a, like a, like a normal, normal traditional <laughs> commercial break. Um, so yeah, I, th I think there's, um, uh, there's lots improved already throughout the years. Uh, the only thing now is just to have make more people aware that, you know, this type of advertising is, um, uh, is really interesting. You have direct data, you know you're reaching uh, and you can do it, you know, more targeted. 
I think that's the, the message we all need to drive home to the advertisers. Yeah, sure. For us, it's obviously quite a new area. Uh, again, it's, uh, we have a previous experience of monetizing social platforms like YouTube or Facebook, but connected TVs, we, we're learning as we go along. But definitely that's one of the area where we see amazing growth. Uh, we want to focus much more on this, understand this space and be able to, to monetize our content in a much, much more sophisticated way as we go forward. So definitely one thing which we saw through COVID was that, uh, strangely enough, despite the advertisers pulling pretty much out of the market, so obviously the, the viewing hours just kept on going. However, the advertisers were pulling out of the market. But weirdly enough, the programmatic, the bottom sort of level of the programmatic stayed quite stable or started growing back quite quickly because advertisers were, advertisers were afraid to commit the whole big budgets to uh, campaigns, but at the same time, they were quite comfortable of just spending the money as they went along. So that was one big benefit we saw of actually working with uh, connected TVs where you have this ability, if something goes wrong, you still can monetize your content. What we also see as a much bigger, there's a much bigger, couple of much bigger opportunities, which at the moment is still a bit of a blue sky thinking, but we think it's an opportunity, is creating sponsorships opportunities. Uh, some of our content launched as a, because it's launched as a single uh, title channels, uh, or even sort of the, 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 the genre-based brands, it has a lot of potential and attraction for uh, sponsors who want to do something special around it, competitions or uh, maybe we can even launch some of the titles for on exclusive basis. The third thing is actually on a much bigger scale, combining our e-commerce abilities. So apart from monetizing catalog, Endemol Shine also has the, a brand licensing division. Well, just to give you an example, we license a MasterChef as a brand on, with a lot of products. And given now the Samsung launching the Samsung Health app, I think over time, there's a much bigger ability for actually companies kind of combining across both the video and the sort of lifestyle products like this and being able to actually create some kind of cross ability to monetize brands IPs on a, on a sort of much bigger scale. Okay, well, just in 30 seconds, I'll ask you first, Aaron, and then David, just spend a minute just to finish up. I mean, do you see AVOD in the connected TV environment serving a very specific purpose uh, for you and what is it say compared to the rest of the sort of the streaming world that you could use whether it's subscription based or, or other forms uh, so for us uh, as inside tv you know we're, we're doing only uh, at this point non-scripted uh, you know creating content connecting uh, social media influences with storytelling in, in longer forming basically diving into those areas um, at this point it's we see connection driving people from social media or to, to some of these devices and the shows on Samsung TV Plus connected uh, with, with Samsung and the promotion elements. We have sometimes of these banners immediately click through what we're seeing um, uh, to our channel. At this point, that, that works really well. So um, uh, the linear digital streams is something we keep doing and try to build out uh, VOD is you know the VOD assets like the video on demand assets i think our content is more built for linear broadcasts or linear streams because then people stay there and just keep watching uh so we're focusing on that uh, but yes via ott however you call it um th that's the way to go yeah okay and david just wrap us up for a minute with you know the purpose of avod and connected tv avod in the bigger picture if you like so, okay, uh, you know, very broadly, I guess the way I'm seeing it, you know, from a product perspective um, at Samsung is, you know, if we, if we just park, you know, traditional broadcast TV to one side, um, there's always going to be a time and place for, you know, live viewing, you know, scheduled broadcast viewing, particularly for news and sports, we'll park that to one side. And then we turn to VOD. And I think, you know, very crudely, there's two models. There's the SVOD, the subscription services, and then you've got AVOD. Just very briefly on SVOD, um, there's already some very well-established players in that market. And over the last 12 months, we've seen some big players come in. So, you know, if you look at your home screen on a Samsung TV, you've got Netflix, you've got Amazon, you've got Now TV in the UK. We've seen Apple TV Plus come in, Disney Plus come in, 
and the Brit BritBox offering as well. So you've got, you know, six apps off the bat there that are charging, you know, seven, eight pounds a month. I think what we're going to see over the next 12 months is that space really firm up and consolidate. Um, and when you play in a monthly subscription with your TV license, with a satellite or cable subscription, you can be anywhere between 80 and 100 pounds per month to have all your content delivered for you. So unsurprisingly, I think that the really exciting place to be now, where there's a lot of evolution uh, and dynamics going on, is in the AVOD space. And this isn't new. I'm parking again the BVOD you know, advertisers because they're well established, part of the broadcast ecosystem. We're looking at the new players in this space. We've got established AVOD offerings. You know, YouTube goes without saying. We've also got Facebook Watch. You've got IMDB TV from Amazon. The Roku channel is an AVOD funded model. Uh, but you've also got players that were typically transactional VOD like Rakuten, where you'd go in and, and choose, choose a movie, but they're producing more AVOD fund, funded content now as well. So unsurprisingly, this is where Samsung is investing hard. It's into Samsung TV Plus, so we can bring on content partners. And hopefully for these content partners, because we have that data and measurement, we can help them test and learn. We're seeing this very much as a, a new playground. And when you start to think about some of the new content coming in, we talked about with Kasia, you've got your old school favorites. We're taking Tom Shelby from Birmingham to Berlin soon, but we've got some amazing new long form content content from Aaron as well. Um, you know, for one, I'll just quickly say um, just about creating new genres, which I think is incredibly exciting. Um, there's a great series called female heroes uh, on insight TV. I've got an eight year old daughter. So we're watching these, documentaries about female role models. There's a five time uh, motocross champion on there. There's surfers, skateboarders. Um, and I don't know what genre that is, maybe little girl empowerment or something. You know, yeah. so we're creating these new genres and it's all in the AVOD space. And because it's ad funded, it's essentially free content. And because platforms like Samsung have the scale, we can generate enough revenue to help support the funding of new content. And I think the last thing is, People in this day and age know the value exchange. If you want free TV, let us serve you some ads. If you opt in, we can personalize those ads and generate more revenue for our content partners. So you can get this breadth of content for free on the big screen in your, in your home. So unsurprisingly, I think AVOD is the future and it's an incredibly exciting place to be right now. Okay, well, I know there's a lot of analysts who are very excited and bullish about AVOD including, of course, the, uh, the non-broadcaster AVOD, as you mentioned. So uh, it's a great area and we could talk all day, but because of time, we do have to wrap it up. So I must thank you all very much, uh, each of you for joining us today and um, just say thank you.